not too long ago there was a, an eclipse of the sun and there was this huge deal made about it and at the time I put this together and then I just decided you know what I, I'm, I don't even want to put this out because number one all this to do was being made of this eclipse as though this were some sort of prophecy which was completely bogus but at the same time there were a lot of people who didn't necessarily believe in that but they were riding the wave and we don't do that so i thought it was a good segue into this topic but then i started thinking you know i don't even want to do this right now because i don't want to come across as riding the wave because that's not how we function we don't operate that way now we'd get a lot more views if we did but that's not what we do so i've postponed this until now because that wave is gone and I don't want to ride that wave but it does work well as a wonderful segue so what we're going to look at is a 3-1 eclipse of the Sun a triune triune means three in one so we're gonna look at a three three eclipses that are really overall one eclipse so eclipse number one is the eclipse of the word and in Psalms 119 105 it says thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path so the purpose of the word of God is to shine a light before us so that we can see where we're going and yea even to see where we've come from but the devil doesn't want us to see where we're going or really where we've come from so he wants to eclipse this light in my life today 24.2 we're told he who makes these this these are the Bible truths a part of his life becomes in every sense a new creature he has not given new mental powers, but the darkness that through ignorance and sin has clouded the understanding is removed. Now, before we go to the next statement, I just want to draw your attention to this. This is what the devil does not want. He does not want us to become new creatures. He does not want us to have our ignorance um, dispelled so that the darkness goes away. That's not what he wants. He wants to keep us in darkness and uh, keep us in this ignorant state. But the only way that he can do that is to eclipse the word. He's got to shade, to haze, to darken the word of God somehow, some way. Great Controversy 51.3. Satan well knew that the Holy Scriptures would, enab would enable men to discern his deceptions and withstand his power. In order for Satan to maintain his sway over men and establish the authority of the papal usurper, we're going to come back to that, the papal usurper, he must keep them in ignorance of the scriptures. Now, she doesn't say this. I'm adding this in here. But in other words, the scriptures must be eclipsed. The Bible would exalt God and place finite man in their true position. Therefore, its sacred truths must be concealed and suppressed unprincipled priests and prelates interpreted its teachings to sustain their pretensions now when the bible is concealed or suppressed or in other words eclipsed by something then the people do not discern the devil's deceptions and this is exactly what he wants papal authority rules and papal authority does rule today within Christianity through its, through its doctrines. Nearly every single Christian religion has some vestige of the papal rule within its doctrines. Men also rise to the position of infallibility, like John chapter 7 and verse 48, where the Pharisees uh, said to the men, so the Pharisees had sent out some men to spy on Jesus. These men come back and they say, uh, no man spake like this man and so the Pharisees look at these guys and say what are you deceived too and then they say in, in 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 verse 48 they say which of us have believed on him in other words their thought process is that they are infallible and these men that went to spy on them they shouldn't believe in Jesus because the Pharisees didn't believe in him which means their thought process is they must be right they can't be wrong so men arise to the position of infallibility as rulers of the remnant and, and and this is exactly what the devil wants he wants people who think that they're infallible or their church is infallible um well he wants people to come to to rulership that present that because they're in control of the church 
and that way people blindly just follow them along. Why would people do that except that the scriptures have been eclipsed in their eyes? They might think they know the scriptures, but in reality they don't know the scriptures. They know man's theology. They know man's understanding. And the scriptures themselves have actually been eclipsed. Five testimonies to the church, 295.3. Satan hopes to involve the remnant people of God in the general ruin that is coming upon the earth. So, brothers and sisters, the remnant church is not immune to this issue. She continues, As the coming of Christ draws nigh, he will be more determined and decisive in his efforts to overthrow them. Men and women will arise professing to have some new light or some new revelation whose tendency is to unsettle faith in the old landmarks. That's important. Their doctrines will not bear the test of God's word, yet souls will be deceived. False reports will be circulated and some will be taken in this snare. They will believe these rumors and in their turn will repeat them and thus a link will be formed connecting them with the arch deceiver. This spirit will, and here's an important point, will not always be manifested in an open defiance of the messages that God sends, but a settled unbelief is expressed in many ways. Every false statement that is made feeds and strengthens this unbelief, and through this means many souls will be balanced in the wrong direction. So she says here that it's not always manifested in an open defiance. Why is that? Well, and that, that's really important because, you know, the devil doesn't come to somebody holding a pitchfork and with a, you know, goat's head uh, and cloven feet and a pointy tail and say, obey me, follow me, do as I say, don't believe of God. He doesn't do that. Why? Because most people are going to say, whatever, I'm not going to follow you. I know who you are. But what he does do, and what he does that to some, there are a few who, who buy into that, but not many. Most people, he has to show up to them as an angel of light. And this is that uh, he's not manifesting himself openly to them. What he's doing is he's being very subtle and he's very subtly bringing people off track step by step by step until finally they manifest in open rebellion. That's the end goal. Not everybody even does that even. But that's the objective. And that's what has to be really, really watched out for. Those statements that sound right, but maybe something just seems to be a little bit off. So I want to share some of these things with you. I want to give some examples as to how the devil has eclipsed the Word of God. Example number one is the atonement. And I've, I've talked about the atonement before. We've got a video out there, the, the, the dual atonement. So I highly recommend you watch that because I go into a lot more depth in this. But this statement comes from Questions on Doctrine, page 354. When one hears an Adventist say or reads an Adventist literature, even in the writings of Ellen G. White, so there's that implanting of doubt. That's just subtle implanting of doubt. Even in the writings of Ellen G. White, that Christ is making atonement now, it should be understood that we mean simply that Christ is now making application of the benefits of the sacrificial atonement he made on the cross. That he is making it efficacious for us individually according to our needs and requests. So I'm not going to go into depth here. Like I said, I've, I've already put out a video and, and so I would refer you back to that. But this is not a dual atonement. This is actually a single atonement. In other words, to put this simply, this is the evangelical message. Everything was done at the cross and what's been going on since October 22nd, 1844, it's a role play. He's just making application of something. He's just applying the cross to us. But that is not the biblical teaching. It is not that at all. But see, brothers and sisters, 95% of people, 98% of people will read this and think, well, that sounds good. That's a dual atonement. No, it is not a dual atonement. It's a single atonement in two parts. There's a huge difference. That's the cross being applied in two parts. Everything is, is the cross. Nothing is really going on today that has any part of atoning for us. It's simply an application. 
So this is a, a, an evangelical message, and it is a destruction of the sanctuary message. It's a destruction of righteousness. It's a destruction of sanctification. But most people don't see it. It is a subtle eclipsing of the word. You've got to watch people like this. They are what I call wordsmiths. They take and they, they construct words in such a way that most people don't catch the full meaning right off. The conscious, the subconscious does, and step at a time you're led astray. But most people don't catch it consciously because most people are not studying the Word of God. How many of you would have caught that? How many of you have caught it? Very few ultimately really have. And so I would encourage you, brothers and sisters, study the Word of God. Study, study, study. Don't take what I'm saying, don't take what anybody else is saying. My job is not to give you the facts and to tell you what to believe. My job is simply to raise red flags f so that you go, hmm, you know, I really need to look at that. And so that you study it for yourself. That's my job, is to get you to look at these things for yourselves. So that's what I want you to do. Go back and look at these things for yourselves. Example number two, the nature of Christ. This statement comes from the kingdom of the cults. He says, our Savior took humanity with all its liabilities. Now he's quoting, sorry, he's starting out by quoting the desire of ages. Our Savior took humanity with all its liabilities. He took the nature, the nature of man with the possibility of yielding to temptation. Desire of ages 117. Now, that's about as simply, simple and as plain of a statement as you can get. It is very simple, very plain. But he's going to go on to interpret it very differently from what she meant. He says, White also speaks of fallen nature. Understandably, not having read all she has written on the subject, these critics conclude that she means that Christ possessed a sinful, carnal, or degenerate human nature. Now, I'm not going to go into all of that. He's, he's not fully right in his, his conclusions here either. He's kind of jumping to the other extreme. But let's continue on and you'll see where he's going with this. And that's the main point is where is he going with this? However, White's writings clearly indicate that when she speaks of the fallen nature of Christ, she means the physical properties of the race, which degenerated since the time of Adam, who was created perfect without the ravages of sin upon either his physical or spiritual being. Adam did not age before the fall, but Christ was born into the world, a true man, and with the curse of sin operating upon the physical properties of the human race. For over 30 years, he endured the aging process. This is from the Kingdom of the Cults, page 559. Now, brothers and sisters, there's a lot of people out there preaching exactly this. Exactly this. When, when Ellen White says that he took human nature, they try to interpret it as to mean, well, he just got hungry and he aged. That's what they're trying to mean. In other words, to put it bluntly, they are putting forth some version of original sin. That is a very common doctrine out there. Within Adventism and within those that claim to be non-Trinitarian Adventists, it is a very prominent doctrine out there. But this is another way in which the Word of God is being eclipsed. The simple statement where she says, the Savior took humanity with all its liabilities. He took the nature of man with the possibility of yielding to temptation. Oh, no, no, that's not what he really meant. That's not what she really meant. She meant he aged. No, that's not what she meant at all. And that's not what the Bible means when it says that he took the seed of Abraham. It means he could have sinned. We're going to see something about that here in just a minute. Questions on Doctrines presents the official position. This is also from the Kingdom of the Cults, page 560. Uh, just so that, for clarification here, he says, Questions on Doctrine presents the official position of the Adventist denomination regarding Christ's sinless nature. It is to that position that I can say, Amen. So, just for people that, that may not realize this, but Questions on Doctrine sets forth the official position of corporate Adventism. Now, if you don't know what that teaches, then you don't know what, what you believe, if you're a part of corporate Adventism, that is. Brothers and sisters, I highly recommend you study and you look to see what that teaches. 
because the things that I'm saying here, that, that I'm putting forth, are exactly what the Questions on Doctrine teaches. Actually, all of the subjects that, we're, that I'm putting forth are found in Questions on Doctrine in the wrong way. So, you look at what is being taught. Don't just accept it. It doesn't, it, don't just take what your local church is saying because you're a part of a bigger thing and you will be held accountable for more than just your local church. You will be held accountable for the corporate thing. So again, Questions on Doctrine presents the official position of the Adventist denomination regarding Christ's sinless nature. It is to that position that I can say amen. That's important. He says to the official position of corporate Adventism, I say amen. And what is that position? Kingdom of the Cults, 560. Some have believed that he could have sinned but did not. Others, including this writer, that he could not have sinned. So the official position of corporate Adventism is that Jesus could not have sinned. Why? Well, we'll get into that a little bit later. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail, but we'll see the, the foundational doctrine why that's the case in just a few minutes. But this is what he says amen to. And this is why when uh, he quotes Desire of Ages and says, well, you know, that's not really what she means. Why does he say that? Because... That's plainly what she's saying, and he doesn't agree with it. He's trying to redirect. Example number three, the Trinity Doctrine. And this, by the way, is exactly why Christ could not have sinned, because of this Trinity Doctrine. And I'll actually be looking at this in greater detail in the future. So watch for some videos coming out as to why the Trinity alters doctrines. So I'm not going to go into that in detail right now. Review and Herald 730 of 1981 has this to say. While no single scriptural passage states formally the doctrine of the Trinity, it is assumed as a fact. It is implied. Only by faith can we accept the existence of the Trinity. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm not trying to be harsh. I just want to put something out that I have seen, and that is for those people that try to argue from a biblical perspective that there is a trinity and that the Bible teaches a trinity, not just implied, not implicitly, but explicitly. In other words, it plainly states it. I know instantly that they have not truly studied this topic very deep because every single theologian that, have studied, that has studied this topic deeply will tell you, Oh, it's not actually, actually not in the scriptures. Just as it says here, while no single scriptural passage states formally the doctrine of the Trinity, it's assumed as a fact. It is implied. In other words, it's not explicitly stated. It's simply implicitly stated. It's implied. But there is nothing explicitly there. Only by faith can we accept the existence of the Trinity. See, brothers and sisters, corporate Adventism will will plainly say this. The scholars that have deeply studied this, they'll tell you this. Catholicism will tell you this. They'll tell you there is no plain scriptures for the Trinity. Why? Because there are no scriptures for the Trinity. But yet the Trinity teaches that Jesus couldn't actually have sinned. So again, I won't go into that detail right here and right now. But this is triune eclipse of the word number three. So three examples, I should say, of the first eclipse, which is the eclipse of the word of God. These are three ways that the majority of Christianity has been sucked into the devil's eclipsing the light from the word of God. So eclipse number one is teaching that that which the inspiration clearly states is not actually what it means. And that which inspiration never states, like the Trinity doctrine, is what it actually means. So what it actually states and clearly, it explicitly states, that's not what it means. But what it never actually explicitly states, it's simply assumed and that's what it actually means, even though it never says that. And quite to the contrary, teaches explicitly something very much different. Watch out 
for the wiles of the devil and how he can so subtly eclipse the word of God. So eclipse number two that we're going to look at is the sun. S-O-N. In John chapter 12, verse 46 to 50, Jesus says, I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world. So I, before we go on here, I just want to make this point that if any man hear my words and believe not, that I came not to judge him. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and rejecteth my words has one that judges him. So there is going to be judgment. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. So in other words, Jesus is the light. This is the point that I want to, I want to draw out of this. And I, this is a foundational concept found within the Bible. And I just want to emphasize this. I'm sure everybody agrees with this, but I want to emphasize this before we go on, because this is important. Jesus is the light, and if we reject his words, we are rejecting the light. To reject light, it's to eclipse the sun. It's to eclipse the light. So to reject light, or to eclipse light is to reject it. To reject it is to eclipse it. We, we hide it. We, we, we haze it out. Something along those lines. It depends on the situation as to how deep it goes. But it is a form of eclipsing. So let's look at John chapter 10, verses 36 to 38. Say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent to the world, Thou blasphemest, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. Now, now I want to stop here for just a moment. The plain statement of Jesus is, I am the Son of God. Now, I, I, they are claiming blasphemy against Jesus. Now, I, I want to point this out before we go on. The reason they're claiming blasphemy, and, and the reason that at times they picked up stones to stone him on this topic, was not because he said God had a son. Never once in the scriptures anywhere do you find that the Jews picked up stones to stone Jesus because Jesus said God had a son. They never said, oh, blasphemy, you say God had a son, we're going to stone you. Never do they do that. The reason they go to pick up stones to stone him is not because they've got a problem with the fact that God has a son. They've got a problem with Jesus being that son. Today, it's the exact opposite. Everybody wants to accept Jesus, but nobody wants to accept Jesus is the actual son. They want to pick up stones and stone you for that one and say, oh, that's blasphemy. But nowhere did the Jews do that. They didn't have a problem with God having a son. They had a problem with Jesus being that son. That's where their problem lay. So, but the point is that he says he is the son of God and they say that's blasphemy. They don't like him being that son, but he is the son. So this is the issue today. Is he actually the son? Most everybody says no. He goes on, but if I do, though ye believe me not, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Jesus said he is the son of God. For there is only one genetic son. There is only one genetic son. And why did I use that word? Well, let's go to John chapter 3 and verse 16, and we'll see why. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That word, only begotten, in the Greek is one word. It's a compound word, and it's monogeneus. Now, if you look at that word and break, out, break it apart, it looks like it says monogeneus. It's actually pronounced monoyoneus, but mono is pretty simple. Most versions, or, or I, I call them versions, but they're not actually Bible versions. They're, they're commentaries, really. Um, but anyways, most Bible versions do not translate the whole compound word. They translate the first half of that compound word, mono. Mono means only or unique. Like the NIV says, he's the unique son. 
Is that what the, what the actual Bible says? No. It goes deeper than that. It didn't say mono son. It said mono yeneus son. So what's the second part of that compound word? Yeneus, Ganeus. It's where we get the word genetics. So the translation in the, in the original literally reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only genetic son. Jesus, brothers and sisters, is the genetic son. This is what Jesus said. If we reject what he says, we are rejecting light. Jesus outrightly said, He is the only genetic son of God. 1 John 2, 22, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth Jehovah and Jesus. Is that what it says? No. That is not what it says. you got to watch. Sometimes I can mess up unintentionally. That was an intentional mess up because I, wanted you th I want to draw attention to this. That is not what John said. He did not say he is Antichrist that denies Jehovah and Jesus. He specifically said he is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. So, question, who is the Antichrist? Well, it's the papal system. Not the Pope, not the people. The system is the Antichrist. It is the Antichrist system. Does the Antichrist system deny Jehovah and Jesus? No. Not directly. Indirectly, yes, but not directly. But there's something deeper here. John, under, under inspiration, did not say Antichrist denies Jehovah and Jesus. He specifically said, for a reason, the Father and the Son. He explicitly stated that the Antichrist denies the Father's Son. This would be the relationship. He used these words for a reason. So, they deny the Father's Son relationship. And this is what the Trinity Doctrine does. Remember, uh, I, in Great Controversy 51.3, Satan intends to maintain his sway over men and establish the authority of the papal usurper. To do that, he must keep them in ignorance of the Scriptures. Remember I said we're going to come back to that papal usurper? This is exactly why the devil has to keep men in ignorance of the Scriptures, brothers and sisters, because the Scriptures plainly state what is the Antichrist system? The Antichrist system denies the father-son relationship. And unfortunately, almost all of Christianity has bought in to that denial. Why? Because they allowed that system to eclipse the Word of God and the Son of God. And so as a result, they're walking in darkness. they have accepted the authority of the papal usurper in more ways than one. In fact, we're looking at three ways that the truth has been eclipsed. So, way number two, the eclipse number two, is denying that Jesus is the Son of God. Let's look at eclipse number three now. Eclipse number three, dealing with the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. Now, comparing Scripture with Scripture, 1 Peter 1, 11, same writer and same author, obviously same author, the Holy Spirit, but the same writer as well, says this, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. So, who is the author of the Bible? It is the Holy Spirit. And what or who is the Holy Spirit? It's the Spirit of Christ. Now, <laughs> I want to point something out. This may seem obvious and a no-brainer, but so many people overlook it. The Spirit of somebody is always just that. The Spirit of somebody. Never is the Spirit of somebody somebody other than that somebody. <laughs> That may not make a whole lot of sense with just that, but I would think about that for just a moment. The, so let me give you an example. I've given this example before. The spirit of Daniel is not somebody other than Daniel. In every single case throughout the whole of Scripture, when it says the spirit of Daniel, it's referring to Daniel. There's an aspect of Daniel that it's talking about. It's not talking about another entity outside of Daniel. When it says the spirit of Nebuchadnezzar, 
his, uh, his, he was troubled. His spirit was troubled. He dreamed dreams and his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 1. It is not referring to somebody other than Nebuchadnezzar. In every case, throughout all of Scripture, it is 100% consistent. When it talks about the spirit of somebody, in every single case, it is talking about that individual. It is not talking about somebody other than that individual. So here, when it talks about the spirit of Christ, it's not talking about somebody other than Christ. I realize that that may seem like a no-brainer, but brothers and sisters, most people tend to get this wrong. Even those that understand the concept that the spirit of a man is the spirit of a man. It's not somebody else. But yet they turn around and they want to apply this totally different throughout Scripture. That is not the way you hermeneutically study the Word of God. It is contrary to proper Bible study. The spirit of somebody in every single case is the same. It's the spirit of somebody. So, going back to 2 Peter 2.21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. That Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. It is not somebody other than Christ. The Holy Spirit is the non-bodily personal presence of Jesus, not somebody else. And it is consistent throughout Scripture. Romans 8.26, But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Uttered. Now, point number one, the spirit isn't it here. Why? Because it's not a somebody. It's the spirit of somebody. You don't refer to my spirit generally as he. You refer to my spirit as it. Now, if, if you were to refer to, say something like um, Daniel chapter 2 verse, verse 1. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. If I were to ask what was troubled, you would say his spirit was troubled. Now, is that an it or he? Well, you'd say that's an it. But if I were asked the same question or ask a question based on that same verse, who was troubled, you would say Nebuchadnezzar. Now I ask, is that an it or, who, or he? You're going to say, well, that's a he. Okay, that's exactly the same concept here. The spirit itself. Why does it say it? Is because here it's referring to the spirit as an aspect of Christ not Christ himself. It's an aspect of Christ. But I want to draw this point. The Spirit itself maketh intercession. Okay, so intercession means to plead with somebody on the behalf of someone else. To plead with somebody on the behalf of someone else. Now, contextually here, the Spirit is interceding for us, uh, on, on behalf of us, before God. How many intercessors are there how many are pleading on our behalf before the father that is a question that needs to be asked the bible makes an answer to that and it is very very clear it is not simply an implied answer it is explicitly stated first timothy 2 5 for there is one god and one mediator between god and men the man christ jesus not god the holy spirit there is not two mediators there is one between God and man, and it is the man Christ Jesus. To be more specific, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 tells us, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Not God the Holy Spirit. Never do you find God the Holy Spirit as being an advocate with the Father. Never. There is never, ever anyone other than Jesus as our advocate, our paracletos. So, what is that spirit that makes intercession then? It's the spirit of Jesus. And that is consistent throughout the scriptures. John chapter 14, verses 16 to 18, and verse 20. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that, ye, that he may abide with you forever. Now, a lot of people will come and say, well, see, it says he, and it's referring to somebody other than Jesus. We're going to come back to this, and this is going to be very, very clear, very simple, very plain. So we're going to come back to this verse. We're going to keep going. Even the spirit of truth, now that, that word spirit of truth, that word truth in the Greek is aletheia. And if we go back to John um, 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the aletheia, and the life. So the spirit of truth is the spirit of aletheia. And who is aletheia? It's Jesus. 
even the Spirit of Jesus, then, you could say, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he will, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. So who was it that was dwelling with them right at that point? It wasn't the Holy Spirit. Uh, John tells us that the Holy Spirit had not, uh, that um, the Holy Spirit had not yet been given because Christ had not yet been glorified. So, sorry for the hesitation there. I'm, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of depth on this right now because I've got a whole series coming up dealing with this very topic. And so it's not my intent to go into a deep study on John chapter 14 right now. Um, so I was just right there, I was just debating on how deep to go with this. Uh, but who was it that was dwelling with them right then? Well, it wasn't God the Holy Spirit because, uh, number one, that's unscriptural. But number two, the Holy Spirit had not yet been given because Christ had not yet been glorified. So who was it that was dwelling with them right then? It was Jesus. Jesus was dwelling with them. Who is it that was going to be in them? Jesus was going to be in them on the day of Pentecost and from there on. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus was given a prophecy of the day of Pentecost. So uh, the spirit of Jesus, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwells with you. Who is dwelling with them right then? Jesus. Who is it that was, and he shall be in you. Future tense, shall be in you. Who is it that was going to be in them? Jesus. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. At this day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and, and uh, ye in me, and I in you. He doesn't name somebody other than the Father and himself as being in them. So let's jump down to verse 22. Again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on this, but I, I still want to touch on this right now, in case you don't see the, the upcoming series. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? And this is, brothers and sisters, is important. Judas did not say, Lord, how is it this other guy is going to manifest himself to us? No, 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 that's not what Judas said. Judas said, Lord, how is it that you are going to manifest yourself unto us? I don't get it. In other words, Judas understood that Jesus was not talking of somebody other than himself. Jesus, as the comforter, the parakletos in the Greek, and who is the parakletos? Who is the advocate? Jesus is the advocate. Who is the parakletos here? Jesus is also the parakletos. So Judas understood that Jesus was referring to himself being in them. And Judas is like, how are you going to do that? I, 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 don't, I don't quite get it. How are you going to be in us? Ah, now here's where silence is golden. Not who, but how. The nature of the Holy Spirit is where silence is golden. Not who the Holy Spirit is, or not whose spirit it is of. That is plainly stated. It's the Spirit of Christ. But how? That is where silence is golden. Judas didn't understand it, the disciples didn't understand it, and Jesus didn't actually answer that question. So therefore, it's not told to us how. So we can speculate, but we need to be careful about speculating in this area. So, this is why, in going back up to verse uh, 16, so the Comforter, the Paracletos, is Jesus. So why does he say that... Um, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Doesn't that mean somebody else? That uh, he's going to give somebody else to them? That word, another? No. Another is referring to the form in which Jesus is coming. So, Jesus was being a comforter to them right there in physical form. And they were going to yearn him. They were going to be very sad at their loss very, very soon. And they were going to need a comforter again because they're going to lose their comforter. They're going to need a comforter, a paracletos. And so Jesus is saying, look, don't mourn my loss because I'm coming back in another form. I'm going to, gi I'm going to give you another comforter or I'm going to come back in another form as your comforter. And the disciples understood this. They, they, they were not in confusion as to who. They completely understood that Jesus was going to be their comforter. They just didn't understand how. So who is their comforter? It's Jesus. You can find this statement in many different places, but 
Uh, I've got it here from PRT, May 30, 1895, paragraph 7. And here Ellen White says, Cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore it was altogether for their advantage that he should go, or that, that he should leave them, go to his Father, and send the Holy Spirit to be his successor on earth. Now to this point, the Holy Spirit may sound like somebody other than Jesus. But let's continue on and let's follow the wording. The Holy Spirit is himself. Who is himself? Jesus. Who was just spoken of? Jesus. The Holy Spirit is Jesus divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. Now that word divest means simply the best way to say it is to take off a vest. To divest yourself of something is like taking off a vest. Now can the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, divest himself of humanity? No. Why? Well, number one, there is no such thing. But number two, even if there was, God the Holy Spirit never took on humanity. One and only one ever has taken on humanity, and that's Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus. He is the only one that has humanity, so therefore he is the only one that can divest himself of humanity. So the Holy Spirit is, therefore, Jesus divested of that humanity. Remember, humanity was cumbering him. So somehow... How? I don't know. I couldn't answer that. We're not told, so I can't tell you how. That's one of where silence is golden. The disciples asked the same question, Lord, how are you going to do this? And they weren't told. So I don't know how. But the fact is that the Holy Spirit is Christ himself divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. Christ would represent himself as present in all places by his Holy Spirit. Remember, the spirit of somebody, in every single case, is just that. The spirit of somebody. It's never somebody else. Uh, as the omnipresent. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall, although unseen by you, teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Why was it expedient? Because Christ needed to go away, gain permission to divest himself of the personality uh, of humanity so that he can become independent thereof. In other words, uh, Jesus would send his spirit, not somebody else, his own spirit to be their comforter and to be our comforter. It is Christ that does not leave me alone. And it is Christ that is in me in another form as the spirit of truth pleading with me on behalf of the Father. So that the Patakletos is an advocate. John, in John chapter 2, verse 1, writes of the Patakletos as the, the Son standing before the Father, pleading, my blood, my blood. He is bodily before the Father, but at the same time in John 14, John 16, uh, John is telling us that Jesus is the Patakletos here on earth. Now, how can he be here on earth and before the Father at the same time? Well, he's bodily before the Father, and he's here in another form in spirit form, not bodily, not in a cognitive understanding, not like a, a bodiless brain floating around. It is his spirit. Just like I have a spirit, just like you have a spirit, so does Christ have a spirit. The difference between our spirit and his spirit is the fact that he is divine and we are not. But it is not somebody other than Jesus. So eclipse number three is denying Jesus dwelling in you as the spirit of truth. The devil does not want Jesus dwelling in you. He wants somebody else dwelling in you. Why? Because nobody else has been tempted. Nobody else knows what it's like to feel that temptation and has the power to overcome. And the devil does not want that in you. He wants somebody who's never experienced that in you so that you will never overcome. And if you never overcome, then he prolongs his time on earth. He knows that his time is short. But brothers and sisters, the more he can keep us from overcoming, the longer he's got. The triune eclipse is three eclipses in one church. There is one church, well, there's multiple churches, but one church in particular, the, the, the corporate Adventist church, is eclipsing the Word of God, as we were talking about with the dual atonements and those other things. It's eclipsing the Son of God by bringing in a Trinity doctrine and denying Jesus as the Son, which is blasphemy. And it's also denying Jesus as the Holy Spirit, and it's trying to put somebody else in his place. The devil wants you to have a different intercessor than that of Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. 
Here Jesus tells us, ye are the salt of the world. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall ye be salt? Shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but, the, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Brothers and sisters, if the church does not have something to bring to the world, then what good is it? If it does not have that salted flavor, if you will, then the world won't want it. Why? Because there's no difference between the church and the world. And this is what Jesus is saying. If it has lost its savor, then what good is it? If there's no difference between the world and the church, then why would the world want it? It doesn't. Continuing on, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Brothers and sisters, we cannot let our light shine if it has, that light has been eclipsed. We cannot let our light shine if in the eclipsing of that light we have lost the Word, we have lost the Son of God, and we have lost the overcoming life of Christ in you. The hope of glory we don't overcome so if we're not overcoming then what light are we giving we're not giving a light we're not reflecting any light we're reflecting ourselves if we're not overcoming the church is to reflect the light but when it twists the word of god and denies jesus as the son of god and says it was someone other than jesus who inspired the word and who pleads to the father on our behalf it's eclipsed the light the law says thou shalt have no other gods before me but the church has said there are two others that are co-equal. What is the result in eclipsing the light? Matthew 24, 12, And because lawlessness shall increase, the unconditional love of many shall wax cold and decrease. We are to be the light of the world. The church was to be the light of the world. But brothers and sisters, the light has been eclipsed. And so therefore it is no longer salt to the world. It's no longer being a light to the world. Which means the love of many has waxed cold and decreasing. The sins of the world lies at the feet of the church. Why? Because it has been eclipsing all these things. It's been eclipsing the sun through the word, through denial of the Son of God, and through a denial of who or what the Holy Spirit is. It is easy to point the finger at the corporate church, though. So I want to bring this closer to home. But the fact still remains that the love of many is decreasing. We can stand here and point the fingers at this church, that church, this group, that group, all we want. But the fact is, the love of many is still decreasing. You know what that means? Why would this still be happening unless God's true church, us, has something eclipsing our lights? There's more than three things that can eclipse the light, brothers and sisters. Another thing that can eclipse the light? Sin. Jesus tells, uh, in saying, talking about John the Baptist in John 5.35, he says he was a burning and a shining light. The third Elijah is also to be a burning and shining light. In order for this to happen, our lights cannot be eclipsed by error or by sin. In order for us to be a burning and shining light, our lights cannot be eclipsed by error or sin. So, brothers and sisters, let's say you don't have any error. Why has Jesus not come? And this is referring to me as well. Why has Jesus not come? Because there's something else. Sin. I'm not saying we've got all the light, but there's something greater there. And I, I, want, I want everyone to think about this. What sin is in my life that may be eclipsing that light so that I'm not reflecting it to a dead and dying world? My question to you is, will you endeavor to find out if you play any part in eclipsing the sun and ask God to remove it? What part, if any, and it, it, the only way you or I would not have a part to play in this is if we're part of the 144,000. I can tell you right now, I'm not a part of that group. Not at this point. It is my goal to be a part of that group. 
but I'm not a part of it at this point. So therefore, I have to ask myself and brothers and sisters, I pray, I hope, I appeal to you that you too would ask yourself the question, what part do I play in eclipsing the sun? And will you ask God to take that away, to remove that? Will you, will you do that with me? If so, then I would ask that you would kneel with me in closing prayer where possible. Heavenly Father, we come boldly before your throne of grace, not because of anything we have done. Quite to the contrary, Father, all that we have done is to separate ourselves from you. But it is what Christ has done that has uh, bridged that gap and has allowed us to come face to face with you. And Father, we come boldly, again, not because of any pride, but because of Christ's command to do so. And so we come boldly before your, great, before your throne of grace, petitioning the gift of your Spirit. Father, light up our lives and show us where we have eclipsed the light in our life. Father, we, I think we all want Jesus to come soon, but that's not going to happen if the light isn't shining through us. So I pray that you reveal where we play a part in this. I pray also that you re will help each one of us to proclaim the light that we do have to a dead and dying world, that you will help each one of us to show the error that is out there in a way that will bring glory to you. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.